Our speaker this morning, Jim Brazell, is a consultant, researcher, and orator focused on community competitiveness, educational innovation, and emerging technology and jobs. Please welcome Jim Brazell. Sputnik, October 4, 1957. The Soviets launch an R-7 rocket and change American education forever. The response to Sputnik in the United States was to create the National Science Foundation, the Defense Appropriations Research Project Agency, and NASA. NASA, in turn, according to many economists, has fueled up to 50% of the wealth creation in the past 50 years. The result of technologies coming out of the NASA program is what has created the U.S. economy that has been so strong for so long. And where we sit today is in a global tide and a new economic order. And what's needed today is innovation, perhaps fundamentally nowhere else more important than in education. You see, the response to Sputnik was not only to change our research and development base in our universities and companies in pursuit of the moon mission, but we also funded K-12 education in the 1950s and 60s as a result of programs that were created and funded to change our American competitiveness in math and science. Today, we stand at a very similar point in time. The results of Sputnik created the space program, we went to the moon, landed on the moon, and once again, the technologies coming from the moon program, primarily the, the commercialization of computer technologies, changed the U.S. economy forever. Today, we have no single object, no beeping sound, nothing to focus on that says we need to change. But we do have a silent Sputnik in America today, and it's represented by the convergence of these three trends. First, globalization. Now, we hear a lot about globalization, but what is it really? Essentially, globalization is about integration, integration of economies, integration of industries, integration of geographies. The second trend changing the world, not just the United States, is changes in demography. The translation here is the increasing diversity of U.S. populations and global populations, either due to immigration or changes in birth rates and population growth in the United States and in the rest of the world. How many of you have heard of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? Well, there's a movement and has been in the United States for some time to increase our competitiveness in our workforce and economic development system by increasing the rigor of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in our schools and increasing our students' performance in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But the call to increase STEM performance actually is more about increasing our capacity for innovation. And in order to increase our capacity for innovation, we have to move beyond just focusing on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to include the arts in that transformation. The arts are key to our ability to innovate. So the third trend is technology, engineering, arts, math, and science. And specifically, where globalization represents integration and demography represents diversity, what's happening in technology, engineering, arts, math, and science is about innovation. According to Ray Kurzweil, a futurist and technology forecaster, we will see as much new science and technology innovation in the first 25 years of the 21st century as we saw in the whole, in the entirety of the 20th century. Imagine a hundred years of science and technology progress rolled into the first 25 years of this century. Now, we're about nine years in, and usually at this point, I spend a lot of time, about an hour, showing you examples of how that forecast is actually coming true today. But what I'd like to do is actually just show you a few examples and then move on to the pedagogical implications of innovation. Our Sputnik is the convergence of these three trends, and they themselves are actually integrating, which is to say that the interdependence between diversity, integration, and innovation is increasing. This integration is a movement or a merging of these three trends. Now, I, if I ask you to characterize the 21st century environment, or put another way, what are the big problems of the 21st century, 
The answer is, of course, things like war and terrorism and hunger and poverty and our economy and the state of our education system. They're really, really big problems. In order to solve these problems, we need to understand how we can innovate in education. But before we can answer that question, we need to understand what's happening with innovation in the world of science and technology. I said earlier that the result of pursuit of the, the Man on the Moon program essentially resulted in the economic generating engine that created the wealth of the United States and has sustained us up to this point as a global superpower. So let's take a look at where we are with technologies that have flowed from the aerospace industry and specifically the Man on the Moon program. In computing, how many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Moore's Law? Okay, so we know what's happening there is that computing power is increasing or doubling about every two years. What you see here is the ENIAC created in 1947 by the U.S. Army. It was one-fifth the size of a football field. And when they turned it on, the, the power, the lights in the city went boom. Right? It's absorbed so much power. It was one-fifth the size of a football field. At the 50-year anniversary of the ENIAC, Al Gore presented the equivalent computing, memory, and hard drive capacity in a computer the size of a dime. And that demonstrates Moore's, Moore's Law. Now, the same thing is happening in communications capacity. There's a doubling every two and a half years in our bandwidth or our communications capacity in wireless communications. In 1895, Marconi invented the radio, and since that time, we've seen this doubling every two and a half years so that we have a 100 trillion fold increase in the bandwidth or communications capacity in the world of wireless communications. This is perhaps demonstrated best by your cell phone. If you have one of the new advanced services like EVDO on a Verizon phone or broadband capability plugged into your laptop and you're on a cellular network, you're communicating at probably at least about 1.5 megabits per second. And that costs about $100 per month. In 1995, I owned an internet service provider and purchased the equivalent communications capacity for $17,000 per year and they had to dig trenches and lay cables to get it into the building. Today, we can get it on our cell phone. So that demonstrates Cooper's Law. Another tangible example of this today is the Xbox 360. The Xbox 360 operates at one teraflop per second. Translation, in 1995, the equivalent amount of computing power would cost about $100 million. So what's happening in the world of gaming is that gaming is moving from the domain of entertainment into other segments. You see, what we often miss in gaming is that games and gaming platforms are not content, which is to say it's not just about text, image, audio, and video, but about the fact that games are a medium as opposed to media. The difference is that a medium can send a signal, receive a signal, and store a signal. Couple that with Cooper's Law and what's happening in communications, and it begs the question, can we use video games in applications related to education? In fact, that movement has begun about 20 years ago in the defense industry, and it's called the Serious Games Movement and the Serious Games Industry. An example of this is this is a video game called Pulse, which is developed by the Office of Naval Research and Corpus Christi A&M University to teach operating room nurses about the pressures and procedures of working in an operating room. This is a video game that you can download free on the Internet, and it's used to teach civics the website is OurCourts.org. It's absolutely free. And it was developed by the Sandra Day O'Connor Center for Justice. Dimension M is a product from a company named Tabula Digita. And they're using video games to teach mathematics. When was the last time that you saw groups of students excited about math? Uh, I would make the recommendation that if there are other large uh, school districts who are interested in sort of coming on board and providing a 21st century environment for 21st century students, that they should do, they should do this as well. All right, New York, you ready?
that we've seen in the classrooms where we've piloted this has been the engagement of students in algebra and the relevancy of mathematics that suddenly emerges in the students to want to learn algebra actually to compete better in the game. to think quick, they have to solve problems. Teachers, educators need to know about this. Uh, there is no problem with it catching on. There is no problem with student usage. It's just a matter of fitting it into the curriculum. I feel proud and happy to, to win for my school. I have no reservations being involved in get, and getting students and teachers ready for national competitions. Uh, New York is ready and uh, we're ready for California, Chicago. Let the games begin. In Florida, the University of Central Florida conducted an efficacy study of that video game and its impact on mathematics, and they found that it increased students' FCAT scores. The other movement, you know, I've been sort of talking about computing in general, um, is the coupling of computers to other devices. And a good uh, way to define this is using some jargon that the rest of the world uses to describe the embedding of computing into machines. This is called mechatronics. It's a fancy word for your car. It's a fancy word for your ATM machine, your washing machine, your dryer, your microwave, and your, your stove. All of these things today include embedded computing devices. And mechatronics is not a future technology. It's here today. It simply means intelligent machines or the coupling of computer processors with machines, sensors, and actuators. A sensor like eyes, ears, nose, and mouth might measure temperature, velocity, acceleration, or other factors, and an actuator is simply a muscle or a motor. So examples of where we are today with mechatronics, I, and I named some of them, but let me spend some time on the jobs that relate to mechatronics. Um, automotive technicians today need more advanced skills than simply being a mechanic, because today all of the diagnostics in your automobile are performed by coupling a computer, which is in the service bay of the auto dealership, to the computers embedded inside of your car. So this has changed the dynamic or the kind of workforce characteristics that are needed by people entering the automotive industry. So if you drive a car made in the last 10 years, the car you came here in today has as much computing power as was used to put man on the moon. Did you realize that? You're driving as much computing power as was used to put man on the moon. How many of you drive a hybrid automobile? What are you getting in miles per gallon? 48 to 52 miles per gallon. You have a Prius. So do I. During the presidential debates, there was a lot of talk about producing an automobile that would go 100 miles per gallon in mass markets. And essentially what happened in California some time ago is that some guys got together with some wrenches and screwdrivers and replaced their battery and created a plug-based Prius. See, a Prius is a hybrid. It has an electrical motor and a battery plus a four-cylinder combustion engine that burns gas. 
but they modified the Prius to be 100% electric, and by doing that, they were able to produce a car that gets up to 100 miles per gallon. In fact, over a 1,000-mile uh, range, they produce 98.5 miles per gallon, and this is a kit upgrade you can purchase for the Prius. Toyota recently announced that they'll produce a plug-based Prius that gets about 100 miles per gallon in 2010, which means they have about a year to a year and a half to roll it off the production line for delivery in 2010. So the 100 mile per gallon car is not a high bar of innovation. In fact, it's where technology is today. How many of you have seen the Tesla from California? It's going to be produced in Silicon Valley. This is a Roadster like a Porsche. It essentially gets, it's 100% electric. It goes 0 to 60 miles per hour in 3.9 seconds, 256 mile per gallon equivalent, and it costs less than 2 cents per mile to drive. Now, the car costs between ninety dollars and $120,000, but remember, it's equal to a Porsche. The company is a bit late in the delivery of its commercial vehicle, but it does have pilots running, and they plan to produce a sedan for the mid-market as their next model. These cars are, in fact, robots. They're not just mechanical systems, but elaborate computer systems combined with cars, actually robots. This is a 1,000 mile per gallon fuel cell car. Would it surprise you that this car is produced by a high school? The car was created by Los Altos Academy of Engineering right outside of Los Angeles, and the program is a career and technology education program. When these students showed up to compete in this competition, they were the only high school group. At Shell, everyone who entered were from industry or universities. This was the only high school entry, and they produced a 1,000 mile per gallon fuel cell car. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the future of K-12 education. It's called career and technical education. So what I'd like to do today is talk about the model of 21st century learning. What I'd like to do is pick apart what's happening at the Los Altos Academy of Engineering, but also show you how we can solve problems of scale, which perhaps may be much smaller, to produce this same kind of learning system. Second, I'd like to talk a little bit about jobs. Third, examples of this 21st century model of learning. And finally, the kinds of outcomes that you might expect. Just a couple of years ago, in 2006, the National Science Foundation released this statement. If the US is to maintain its economic leadership and compete in the new global economy, the nation must prepare today's K-12 students better to be tomorrow's productive workers and citizens. Changing workforce requirements mean that new workers will need ever more sophisticated skills in science, math, engineering, and technology. The point here is that the call to increase students' capacity for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and what I would call for innovation, which would include the arts, means that we need to increase all students' capacity, not just those that are going to be engineers and scientists. It's true that we need to produce more engineers, scientists, and technologists, but we also need almost every student to master higher rigor in mathematics and science because all of the jobs today include these kinds of technology. I mean, think about it. Have you been to a Burger King lately, been through the drive through They look like a SEAL team, right? They got wireless communications. They're running a point of sale terminal. The thing that cooks the hamburgers will call the fire department if there's a fire before a human does. They're running elaborate technology systems, so they need to be able to follow procedures, and they need to be able to use technology even in the unskilled jobs that we have in the United States. This is the new face of CTE. And so what would you call this kind of educational innovation? Well, Dr. David Thornburg has worked out a model. If you're familiar with David, he's from the Center for, for Professional Development and been doing K-12 teacher education for about 20 years with a focus on technology. And basically what David says is that Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is a system. In other words, mathematics is the language of engineering and the language of science and the language of technology. These things are all interrelated. In engineering, do you use technology like computers? In science, do you use technology like computers? Right, so all of this stuff is actually interconnected. And so when we say that the traditional model of education, the industrial model of education has become outmoded, what are we saying? We're saying that essentially industrialization brought about specialization. It brought about fragmentation of knowledge. 
It brought about traditional disciplines as we see them today and what many people call silos between the disciplines. You see, we try and isolate what we're trying to teach because that's what we did on the assembly line. We specialized what workers did. And in fact, around 1919, a book was published called The Principles of Scientific Management. And this was Frederick W. Taylor, F.W. Taylor. He took a stopwatch and he basically figured out that you could do something called task allocation. Have you ever heard of that? It's what we do in education. It's how we chunk and break up and stratify and organize what we're going to teach. That comes out of industrialization. So essentially what the new economic system is about is it's about systems and how all of this is connected together as opposed to how it is differentiated, different, siloed, and specialized. So 21st century education is about teaching the relationship of these systems. But more importantly, as in the model where they created this 1,000 mile per gallon fuel cell car, what we're doing is solving a real world problem. For a long time in education, what we've done is attempt to isolate students and say, the real world is out there, and this is the school of education. Essentially, what transdisciplinarity does, or what this new kind of education does, and it's not really new, it's an old idea that's become important again, is what this new idea of education, or this emerging idea of education called transdisciplinarity does, is it engages real-world problem solving theoretical knowledge and applied learning at the same time. So let's pick it apart. If you're at Los, Los Altos Academy of Engineering and you're the teacher, by the way, what do you think that teacher's background was? At Los Altos, where they created a 1,000 mile per gallon fuel cell car, what would you say offhand? He was an engineer. He was a special education teacher. He knew nothing about engineering. The students figure out the problems, right? You remember when the internet emerged and it said, you know, you have to move from sage on the stage to guide on the side? Well, that's still true, but it's not just motivated by the Internet. It's also motivated by the millennial generation's preferences for learning. You see, there's a lot of talk today in our education system and in conferences about how millennials are wired differently. Their brains are wired differently. There's no science that says that that's true. And we, we're out trying to figure out how to adapt our teaching to this non-science theory that millennials are wired differently. What I will tell you is I'm not, it's not proven whether they learn differently. What's, what I can tell you is that millennials, those born 1980 to present, are expressing a preference, a learning preference, a learning style. And do you know what I would call that learning style? Andragogy. Adult learning preferences. One of the, the presuppositions of andragogy, teaching to adults, is you have to tell them what they're going to learn and why it's relevant to them. Why is that so important in adult education and not important in educating children? Well, the reason is because we believe, or the people who set up that theory believe, that adults have the choice, because they're adults, to learn or not, to listen or not. The presupposition there is that children do not. The children have to do what they're told. But what we're missing is that in the 21st century, our children, these millennials, which, oh, by the way, are up to 26 years old now, they're not children anymore, they're the next generation of teachers, are living in a world of information overload. Do you feel it? Information, information. It's just too much information. It's asked for from you all the time to the point that you can't do anything productive anymore. Children are the same way. They live in a world and use the technologies that perhaps we do not even use, and they live in a world where there's a billion choices where maybe we had six choices on television. A billion video channels on the Internet, not to mention all of the other opportunities. We see those as distractions, and perhaps they are, but the bottom line is what we know in the world of information overload is that if you increase the amount of information, you reduce the ability to recall information. Genetically, I believe what happens is selection. What we do then is we, the children begin to select what they're going to tune in or out of. And if they say why, we have to realize that that's the teachable moment. And more importantly, we need to build the why into what we do. We can no longer say, here's what you're going to learn and here's how. We need to start with why. And what we should do in order to engage students, because they're engaged in this real world, in some cases in ways that we, we cannot even imagine, 
is that what we have to do is make the why about solving a real world problem. And then what we do is take the theoretical knowledge. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be bring the students in and say what you want to learn today. You could say, we're going to work on this problem. Dr. David Thornburg is doing it right now. He has children working to solve the problem we have on energy dependence, on environmental degradation, and the economy. That's what Dr. David Thornburg has children working on today. Now, in, by selecting the problems, let's say we're in a math class, can I teach math with that problem? And here's the, here's the real ringer. You ever hear the statement, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to get what we're getting? It goes a different way, right? If you keep doing what you're doing but expect a different result, what is that? Insanity, right? So we keep pushing, drill, and kill, and we keep pushing the theory, and what we're actually doing is lowering the bar in American education. As we lower it, these rising countries like India and China and Brazil and South Korea are beginning to gobble up the economic landscape. We have to raise the bar in American education. So here's the bottom line. If teaching theoretical content using highly theoretical methods, which might include textbook and drill and practice and teaching to the test, which been, tends to be a tendency in many, 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 many schools, then what I would suggest is we should, we should think like physicists and actually turn the problem upside down. The answer is if you want students to master the theoretical knowledge, you have to give them an application of the theoretical knowledge inside of a problem. And by problem solving, we produce innovators, thinkers, people who understand the theoretical knowledge. So you could throw them the problem in different abstract theoretical ways, but because they've mastered the theory through application, they have those critical thinking skills. You see, for too long in American education, we've built a wall between theoretical learning and applied learning. And what we need to do is bring those two worlds together. What I would suggest to you, and what I'm talking to Dr. David Thornburg about, is this integration of the arts. And I'm going to take you a step further. If we're going to see the equivalent of 100 years of science and technology progress from the 20th century in the first 25 years of the 21st century, what we're talking about here is much, much bigger than just a couple of classes or subjects. We're talking about a qualitative transformation of the whole of American education. Because what's happening is that force, remember science, technology, engineering, and math, or technology, engineering, arts, math, and science, innovation, is propelling faster and faster and faster progress in terms of the economy. These innovations are changing the world. And the rate of the rate of change is increasing. In fact, Ray Kurzweil says we'll see as much new science and technology innovation in the 21st century as in the past 20,000 years of human civilization. If he's right, what's happening today is a great transfer of wealth, a change in the economy, geographic makeup, political makeup of the entire world. And what happens when the rate of change is five to ten times faster outside of an organization than it is inside. That organization becomes obsolete. That institution becomes obsolete. So what I'm suggesting to you is that it's not just about the relationships between technology, engineering, arts, math, and science, but about the relationship of the innovation and economics, philosophy, political science, psychology, and therefore requires a transformation of the whole of education. Let me give you an example of this form of learning that integrates applied learning, theoretical learning, and real world problem solving. This is a video game called Biosim. It was created by Carnegie Mellon University and a number of other universities around the world. We often talk about competition, but what we really need is co-opetition, simultaneously competing and collaborating. Now, Biosim is a first person video game and so you see some children here playing the game in pre-kindergarten. Their character is a macrophage inside of the human vascular system. So the model here and where you play is the human vascular system. And your job is to go around and dock your macrophage against other cells and learn about cellular biology. But what the students are told is that the video game, the, 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 the mathematical model of the video game is that the human genome, the actual code of life, is embedded in the game. 
And students are told that many, many people die every year as a result of something called fatal meningitis. And that we don't know which chromosome is responsible for fatal meningitis. And it turns out that the people who designed this video game made it so that docking the macrophage with these other cells in the body seeks to identify the chromosome responsible for fatal meningitis. These ladies and gentlemen are 21st century scientists. They're solving for fatal meningitis. Do you think that students told that they're going to learn about biology but they have the potential to solve a worldwide problem might be more motivated to learn than just being told we're going to teach you about cellular biology when they're five years old? That the motivation, the hook, is solving the real world problem. That's the method of engagement. And then behind that is the integration of applied and theoretical knowledge and learning. This is Whyville Biotech. You can visit it free on the internet at whyville.net, W-H-Y-V-I-L-L-E.net. Whyville is a virtual world that has many problems embedded into it. For example, the people who co-authored Al Gore's book on the environment have created a global warming scenario inside of Whyville and a center for research on the environment. So although the real world problems are simulated in a virtual world context, it still provides the method of engagement, the hook, Whyville.net. So my point is here that you don't have to solve the 1,000 mile per gallon fuel cell car today, and you can use this technique by simply using some tools that exist today. Where am I? Where is Hali Akala? Does anybody know? Hali Akala, where? Hawaii, Maui. Okay, so I'm in Maui. What I do for a living is travel around, study jobs and education systems. So I'm at the top of the volcano. When I say Maui, do you think science and technology innovation? 80% of their economy is driven by tourism. But if you go to the top of Haleakala, what do you find? Most advanced telescopes in the world. What are telescopes? Robots with eyes that look into the universe. This is the back-end computing center where all of the imagery is received from the telescopes on the top of Haleakala. Who are these guys? High school students. What are they doing in a supercomputer center? They're solving real world problems. The uh, computer center also aggregates the data for the global tsunami, tsunami warning center, which is a new warning center which is housed at the Pacific Disaster Center. So now they're monitoring right, ocean tides and currents and essentially looking at what's happening in the world. And this is a community college student who works at the company called Ocean IT that builds these telescopes. What does he do? He does optomechatronics, the combination of computers, mechanical systems, software systems, electrical systems, and optics. Two-year community college degree. This is the lens they build. This is another optomechatronics technician. And if you go to the community college, what they tell you is I'm looking at the intersection of technologies. I want to know where they overlap. Right? Where does optics and computers and software and mechanical and electrical, how does it integrate? Because I have to produce students in two years that can do all of that stuff. In Hawaii, the translation for that kind of integration or mastering what I referred to earlier as systems is ahupua'a. Ahupua'a. Translation. In Hawaiian culture, they don't look at the oceans and say oceanography and the land and say geology and the volcanoes and say volcanology and, and, and essentially the, the, the heavens and say astronomy, they say mother. Mother. Are you following me? If they don't take care of the land, they're deplenishing mother and it's all connected together. It's all one. Ahupua'a, integrated holistic systems. It's actually in the Hawaiian culture this idea of an integrated holistic system. And this is the kind of thinking that indi this indigenous population had. So how does that translate into their technology base today? Well, this is Dan O'Connell, and he has a product line of light-emitting diodes. These are the new lights that you put in, and they last 8 to 10 years, and they're better for your eyes, and they burn less energy. You know, the new green technology movement. 
Well, what is that all about? These light bulbs have computers embedded in them. So now we have robots that are lights. Are you with me? This is not the future. This is here now. And it's about sustainability. They have wind technology. What is wind? Well, at the bottom of this, you have the computer station that runs the wind turbine. At the top of it, 160 feet in the air, you have a giant motor. So you have to know about the integration of the computer and the motor and software and electricity, high voltage electricity, and you have to know about composite materials. That's a system of technologies. Did you know that the very first biodiesel plant in the United States for commercial production of biodiesel was in Maui? What is this about? Well, if you go around this production plant and find out how they take grease, like from the restaurants and hotels in Hawaii, and then convert that into a fuel that can be used. Here we're driving in a diesel bug and we're fueling up on this biodiesel. What you find is that the process technologies, it's called process technologies, are mechanical systems, computer systems, software, and electrical systems, plus chemistry and biology. Holistic system. One person, a technician, needs to know all of those things, as well as the engineers and scientists that work with these technologies. So, subsea robotics, it's the same thing. And then if you look at organic uh, agriculture, you know, not using chemicals, organic requires integration, more science, more diversity, more complexity, more information intensity. This is the trend today in the world, in the environment, not in education. And my point is that we have to catch up with this trend, and it's actually a return to a much older way of thinking that we might call the Renaissance. Because the way we teach today is derived from industrialization, and this is actually a movement backwards. All of these examples, when you look at the educational programs, connect essentially the real world, these real world problems, with applied and theoretical knowledge and learning. So let me give you an example. We're in Hawaii. You think they have a robust uh, restaurant entertainment industry? It's 80% of their economy. What is this? It's the community college dining hall for students. What is the problem? How do we feed our students a healthy meal every day? When we talk about sustainability, the first thing we should be working on is sustainability of ourselves. So the students on this side are in the culinary program, and the students on this side are in the other college programs. And these are the kind of products that they produce. These are actually teachers, but this is what they teach. And many of the students go on from here, work in a restaurant a couple of years as cooks, and then open their own restaurant. Because in Hawaii, they want to know how to create wealth building systems for the indigenous populations. The indigenous population wants to know how to do this, the Hawaiians. In Hawaii, if you look at nursing, 65% of the people moving to Hawaii between the time that I was there, which was last April and 2020, will be retirement age. As the boomers retire, a lot of them are going to seek Maui life. Over the same period, Maui will lose 80% of their nurses in just a decade or so. This is happening in industry after industry after industry because the boomers were a big group and now they're starting to retire. Not, you know, and some people are staying in the workforce longer for sure, but if you look at the retirement projections, even factoring that, what's happening in education? Dr. Thornburg told me that 20 years ago, the average age of science teachers in America was 28 years old and today it's 48. What does that say? You know about the retiring rate of teachers across disciplines in the age of teachers. So how are we going to fill the vacuum between boomers walking off the field and the next generation? Everybody's talking about handing the next generation more debt and problems than any other generation in, in American history. And no one's talking about how do we build the mentoring and the relationships to bring this generation up to speed in order to give them the leadership skills and the thinking skills in order to solve these problems that we have created for them. Plato said it best. War, economy, politics, the problems of the day are all hinged on education. Democracy itself hinges on education. Who is Jim Brazell? Jim Brazell is a professional orator, researcher, and consultant. He has worked for think tanks on issues related to international technology transfer and commercialization. 
he has worked for community and technical colleges to study emerging technologies and make program recommendations. He has supported and created K-12 STEM programs to integrate the arts and build the workforce of the future today. Jim's recent publications and work include publishing several technology briefs and reports for the Texas State Technical College system, including mechatronics, video games, machine-to-machine -machine computing. Jim is an emerging speaker with tremendous accolades from audiences, which include the National Council on Workforce Education, the National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers, the National School Board Association, the National Education Computing Conference, the World Congress on Information Technology, South by Southwest, Chautauqua Institute, and many more. If your community or association is dealing with the issues of globalization and you want to know how to move from the why to the how, you need today's speaker. You need Jim Brazell. I would recommend the presentation to um, educators at the high school level, obviously, and I would also say boards of education and educational leaders all need to see this. This kind of talk would be very successful at our college because we have all the silos that he talked about in terms of the career technical education, um, the awareness of it, and the academic versus the, um, the CTE. I think Jim needs to speak to all the educators and all the educational leadership in the state of California for sure. They've got to hear this message. Oh, I definitely would recommend it to anyone that is interested in career technical education. I, I don't know. I always think more is better. <laughs>